Welcome to Pivot Points, a new series featuring some of the world's most successful women, candidly sharing their stories and insights about how they made it to the top and how you can too. Hosted by Perry Yateman, a straight-talking global executive and award-winning author who created the career and life of her dreams and now wants to help other ambitious women do the same. Welcome. This is Perry Yateman, host of Pivot Points. Today, I am delighted to welcome our guest, Dean Sally Blount. Sally is a personal role model for me and an inspiration. I know you're going to get a lot out of her advice. She is the dean of the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. She's the first female dean of a top U.S. business school, in fact, a top 10 school. Um, Since she has come to Kellogg, she has led the transformation of the school, uh, increasing the quality of the students, uh, hitting unprecedented fundraising levels, um, completely restructuring and reorganizing and delivering operational excellence. You kind of, you name it, she's done it, really trying to recreate higher ed uh, and make it more efficient and more effective for everyone. I know personally she's also a tireless supporter um, uh, of women and women's careers. I've heard her advocate on this subject many times, and I think you're really going to enjoy hearing from her. Welcome, Sally. Hey, Perry. It's great to be here, and it's fun to see you launching this program. This is a topic you and I have both been passionate about for the last couple of years in our own work together as we've done some writing and research. So I'm thrilled to talk about it. I'm thrilled to be one of your early interviews. And um, let's dig in to talk about how do we help women build strong, effective lives. Thank you. And yes, I do want to say absolutely the, the Kellogg School of Management and Sally personally has been a real inspiration for this work and even for this program. So thank you for that. I think I want to start with where kind of we all started, which is launch. Um, at, at some point, all of us have to land that first job. Um, and I think that for some people, that's really tough. And for some people, as you know, Cheryl Sandberg indicated, you know, people are actually bowing out before they even begin. But I know you and I both feel that women need to go for the biggest, boldest job they can possibly get. Tell us a little about how, you know, what job launched you and how did you get it? So it's incredibly important when you leave college that you understand that you're not done getting educated in your 20s. Like in my view, 20s is not a time to find your bliss. Your 20s is a time to begin to become an adult and to learn what the world of work is about and how you can have true impact in that world. And because you're still in an exploring phase and there's no way you can yet know what your unique gifts in the work world are because you've never been there, right? And the process of going to college is not the same as working Um, I think you've got to go for hard jobs. And you and I have talked about how way too often the data shows over and over again, women are not taking the more aggressive jobs. They're not taking the more competitive business and legal jobs. And what I did, my first job out, I have to be honest with you, I didn't like it, but boy, am I thrilled I did it. I worked for the Boston Consulting Group and I was an associate in highbrow management consulting. I traveled a lot. I worked on corporate strategy for Fortune 500 companies. I was up all night. Um, I had a sort of crisis of meaning once when I was in the middle of the night working at the office. I remember saying, I really don't care if this company grows its market share (laughs) by 5% at all, right? But clearly I'm being paid to care. I can't do this in the long run. And that's what began to give me insights about what motivated me. Um, But I learned how to slice and dice a business in that first job. I learned how to construct a supply curve within an industry. And it made me a much stronger thinker. It made me understand how businesses go together and how competitive strategy within an industry works. And so I am a whole lot smarter because I was imprinted by BCG. So I'm indebted to them forever. Excellent. Yeah. I think that uh, most of the really successful women I've, I've talked to, they did have a job. And the thing is that interesting that I'm finding is common is most people didn't really love their first job. Um, but the ones who succeeded were the ones where it really was tough and it was a phenomenal learning curve, which I think is really what you're saying. You need to go for a place that's got a great brand and where you're going to learn like crazy because this is the period of time where you really want to be uh, exponentially increasing your capabilities and your skills. Well, and that branding thing is non-trivial because it cracks me up. I worked there for two years, right? And I still get credit to this day for having worked for this outstanding global consulting firm. You get credit, oh, she was at BCG, yep. right? And 
it's, a, it's really important for people to recognize it's not just the brand of where you went to college. It's the brand of those early jobs can help you later have opportunities that just open doors. And so the branding doesn't end with where you get into college. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think it really is the credentialing of those early employers matters because it gives a stamp of approval and it makes it easier for every other job you take after that. I absolutely. think you're absolutely right. So let's move on. To, to mid-career, I happen to know that you have children and you've been married. And um, and so undoubtedly, and actually, you know, you also cared for parents. So I know you've kind of gone through all of that. It's always a tough balance for women. I think it is between biology and other things. I think it is perhaps tougher for women than for men. We lose a lot of great women at that mid-career point because they just look at the challenges and the trade-offs and they say, you know, frankly, it's just not worth it, Right. I know we both believe that actually it's great if you can stay in. You, you, you have to modify, you have to compromise, whatever, but your career in the long run will be so much better and you will not regret actually staying in the way you think you might. Um, but tell us, how, what choices did you have to make at that period and what was your support system and how did, you, how did you make it work? Well, I've been thinking a lot about it because my mom passed away a year ago and she was my second parent to pass. And I was thinking through of it's just been, oh, basically I was in that phase, if you include both the parents and the kids for just a little over a quarter of a century. Wow. And it's a very strange feeling to suddenly realize I'm done, yep. right? And, I, and I'm done because my mom probably died a little earlier than we might have imagined than my dad for modern. So I, so I was done by 55, yep. right? So that phase was late 20s to mid 50s for me. And I, you know, when people talk about how did you become the first dean of a major U.S. business school and how did you, you know, and right now, if you look even on the global business schools, you know, if you look at the 20, 25 business schools on the Fortune, on the Financial Times top 20, I am the only woman right now, female dean of any business school. And people sort of say, oh, you must have been aiming for that. Like, I am so certain that I was like the dean who almost wasn't. Um, <laughs> And it was on two levels. One is in graduate school. If you'd ever lined up everybody at Kellogg and said, you know, one of these future PhD students will be the future dean of the school, and I guarantee nobody would have picked me because I was the one pregnant pushing the double stroller <laughs> through the halls, right? And this was the late 80s when that nobody did it. Yeah. So nobody would have ever picked that I was going to, and nor yeah. would I have picked. I was just simply trying to get through. Survive, exactly. Right? I had like, I thought I was going to go to a second or third tier school. I was just trying to get the dissertation done. I was trying to make sure that my kids got enough attention. I was try trying to make sure I had enough money for child care. And so this was not something I planned for at all, right? This was me just sort of getting by. And even when I think about my parents and all of that, it's, it was, it's, you just, you just do it because that's what we're called to do. I think if I'd had a strong marriage, I might have quit and had more kids um, because I love babies and I love each child and each personality that emerges. And I often think it was this really critical moment when I went from being married to being a single mother of two toddlers when I stopped feeling guilty about working. Yeah, because, because you have a choice. Yeah, exactly. When you have a choice, you're going, oh, I'm being so selfish by working. When you're suddenly a single mother and you're not clear at that moment about what the income stream is going to be from the father and you're kind of going, I am working to make sure my kids have a good future. Yep. And so it goes from being work being selfish to work being for your kids. Yep. And man, that took all the guilt away. Now, I sometimes felt bad because my daughter Haley, at times when she was annoyed at me, would say, oh, I want an at-home mom, right? Mm -hmm. And now she says, thank God you weren't at home, right? Like, oh, my gosh, if we'd had you full-time, just think, you know. <laughs> well, that wouldn't have worked, Mom. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, but it was this thing is I've often thought that that really tough thing of going away from the guilt and beginning to understand my career was good for my family. That was how I was taking care of my children, that me getting tenure was the most important thing I could do. Now, what my kids also knew, though, is if anything bad happened to them, I would drop everything in a heartbeat and I would be there. Yep. And my kids have this, um, we tell this sort of mythic story where we had the opportunity where I got a consulting off job in in Paris to come teach negotiations to a group of executives. And back then it seemed like so much money and it was enough money such that I could also fly the family to be there for a week with me in an apartment Wonderful. or something. What a it was great really experience. Cool. And so my kids were in Paris. They were like eight years old. We were going to the parks and these things. And my daughter was on a jungle gym and she fell off. And I was actually behind a fence watching her on a, on a bench talking to her. And we both swear I flew over the fence. <laughs> We both could yep. tell you to this well, day. Mamas are superhuman right. when their babies are in but trouble. That was, yep. But that was the whole thing of mom had this way when something went wrong yep. 
of being Swoop there. In. You were so there. even though I was working, I was there. And so there was something about how they knew that if they absolutely needed me, they never doubted I was there. Yep. And yep. so I would say those are the two most important things is you got to get over the guilt and you have to understand that you're doing this for your family. You're doing this for women. You're doing it because your kids, if you are meant to be a working mom, your kids will be better off if you fulfill that ambition in yourself. Yep. And the second one, though, is when you decide to do the juggle, you got to know your kids come first and they got to know it. And if that's clear in your mind, it will be clear in theirs. And years later, they will say, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, I love that story. And it is so true. I had my daughter and, of course, I had her much later than you did. Um it really mattered to me because I didn't feel guilty uh, for a different reason, which is I had already done so much in my career. And I really thought I was finished when I had her. I thought, okay, I'm going to now be a mom. I'm going to open a yoga studio. I and mean, God knows what I was thinking. My husband laughed hysterically. He knew this wasn't going to happen. But nonetheless, he supported me and said, honey, whatever you want to do. And after about three months of being home with my daughter, I really, because I, I had left Unilever and I hadn't joined Craft yet, I really realized, you know, I love her more than anything in the world. I mean, I could stare at this child in a way that I could never sit still for anything else ever. But I knew I was not going to be as good a mom as a stay-at-home mom. I actually couldn't do this as a 24-7 job for the next 17 years. It just wasn't going to be me. Um, and so I also got rid of the guilt because I realized, one, this is now a choice for me. It is not about the fact that I had to. So right. it was the exact opposite of yours. But I didn't feel guilty because I knew I'm going to be a better person. And as long as she knows that I, am, that she is my number one thing, and my, my stepson as well, so Andre, they, they know they're my thing, then I thought, it's okay. I can go fly and do whatever I want. And, of course, then I also, I think, as you say, you've got to have a good support system. And I, I had picked a spouse who was then willing to stay home. But it's very important. So I know that you went from uh, being a PhD student, uh, and then you actually had to transition, as, as we all do at some point. You actually went from being an academic to being a dean, which for people who aren't in academia may not understand the difference, but I kind of think of it as, as moving into management, if you will. Um, any transition like that um, takes a lot of savvy negotiation, so we say. What do you think, if you were trying to help women figure out how to be able to navigate and get what they really want? How would you tell them? What advice would you give them in terms of negotiating? So I'm happy to talk about negotiations. I want, one, I want to talk about the transition. So I went from being a professor who'd never been a department chair to suddenly I was a dean doing fundraising, managing a large administrative staff. And as one of my friends said, you were doing fundraising in New York City. which is Yeah, the, mecca the Uber of fundraising. Of fundraising yep. Um, and so one of the first things I did, because I scaled up fast, right? A lot of, one of the things we know that makes success is if you can scale up by increments, um, and so in my mind, one of the keys to an effective transition is managing how quickly you scale up so that you can learn lessons at smaller scale that then make you, you know, that is less risky than learning them all at larger scale. Um, but one of the first things I did was negotiate actually to have an executive coach. And so I am a huge believer, especially at pivot points and transition points of executive coaching, because really bright people can help you anticipate and see certain twists and turns. And so never being afraid to ask for help and having a safe place for dumb questions or what may feel like a dumb question to you probably isn't, yep. is really important. Yep, I so agree. I'd say I, I would really encourage ambitious women to not be shy about negotiating for executive coaching and or being willing to pay for it themselves, um, that it makes a big, big difference. So that's one piece I put on, especially when it comes to transitions. But let's get to concrete negotiating. One of the things I spend a lot of time on um, when I've taught negotiations in the past is oftentimes the, the word fairness is so important to negotiate because a lot of what you want to tell people is all I'm trying to do is negotiate a fair deal. And so what you and I need to figure out is how do we define what's fair? Because you want to be fair to me yep. and I want a fair deal. And if yep. I'm treated fairly, you know, we're going to have a it's great good. working relationship. Yep. And so a lot of what I had a specialization in, in fact, my dissertation was all about fairness. I'm the middle of three daughters. So oh, yeah, I'm the middle how too. People, how people negotiate fairness. Interesting. And because fairness doesn't exist in the concrete, it's something that's negotiated. And what you have to do is, why do people say markets are fair? They're not fair. We perceive market data about what a similar transaction closed at as fair. Interesting. That's how what we think a fair market price is. Mm -hmm. So when you're going out to a job, as much data as you can get about what other people get in terms of compensation is then what you do is I have this data. I understand you made this offer. I have this data that suggests your offer may be low. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not trying to push you to go anywhere you don't want to go, but but if you know, but I'm just trying to make sure I'm fairly treated and you want to be fair, right? And mm -hmm. so it gets back to 
how do we define what fairness is? So to the extent that you, so I'm big on a fairness mm -hmm. and data to define fairness. All right. And that's why you always want to do your homework in negotiation because as much data as you can collect about people at similar points of development, um, again, or people who have the same job somewhere else and the kinds of things that they negotiate for, the kinds of compensation that they get, and especially on salary where people get really nervous, um, is what you want to do. It's all about data driven, which is here's what my data suggests is fair. And so help me understand. And when somebody says, no, I can't do that. And I, you know, I'll kind of go, okay, I hear you. Um, but help me understand if this is the norm, why that doesn't feel appropriate for your organization. I mean, because because then you want people to verbalize, and it may be you know we're a not for profit, and that's a for profit setting. Yep. And so a lot of what we value here is people who are in mission, and we will pay you comfortably, but we can't match the for profit rate, right? Yep. Now then, I might try to go out and get some not for profit data, right? Yep. Yep. Um, uh, even recently, there was something very funny. There's a really good friend of mine who works um, in the not-for-profit sector, and she just got a promotion. And HR person said, you know, we're going to have to promote you to even more money than we originally thought because you're now this new person is going to be reporting into you, and they make more than you do. And she said, no, it's okay. I don't need it. She goes, I'm working in the not-for-profit environment. Uh, I'm feeling like I'm making plenty of money for this. And I, I saw her off the weekend. I said, you know what? I said, I actually would, I would prefer that you go back and get the money and then agree to give it back to the company as a donation Yep. and get credit for the donation because he's basically saying the market price in not-for-profit is this. Um, and I just think it's really important to get credit. I totally agree if you don't want it, if that's yeah, what you Yeah, if you don't need the money, then that's right? fine. Absolutely. But I think, I think you need to name and claim and own that you've, you know, that this is what what you feel is fair and right in yep. your soul on a, on, but this is more on her own sort of spiritual and philosophical terms. Yep. Um, but markets are markets and that's how the labor market works. Right. Yep. And so that was the place where I was pushing her is that the comparable say that you should be doing this. Right. right. Yep. I would encourage you that and then donate it back. I think that's great advice. Actually. I, I have never heard anybody say that, but I think that's great advice. This is why she's my good friend though. It's like, she's so amazing. Yeah. I mean, I, it, it does make complete sense, but I also agree with you. Um, also for other women, right? Because you actually, when the data comes out the next time, right? If she's not making that number, she's included in the data, which means that the data set uh, continues to drive women down, whereas this was a personal choice um, and so an emission-driven choice. So, Well, and I was, once, I was once interacting with somebody who made me an offer at less than I was currently making. And the data was fully available of what I was making. And it was just annoying because I felt that that person hadn't done their research yeah. and wasn't showing respect to have done that. Now, we worked it through, but a lot of the way we worked it through was I studied so much about negotiations that I knew that I, if I weren't trained, I would overreact and be annoyed. But I did everything then to, to get this person the data to show them just not only was it me, but a whole lot of other people and that maybe that person needed to go do some more research before we sit down to talk some more. You got through the mid-career. You've made a lot of transitions. You now are very clearly at the executive level. You also sit on a board of a major public company. All the way up, it, you know, the research is now showing, and again, talk about fairness. It, it's not fair, but the research says that as men get more senior, they get more popular. They are more likable. As women get more senior, despite our personalities or anything else, we get less likable. When you've had to choose, if you've had to choose in your career, this, this debate of whether it's better to be liked or respected, how have you been able to navigate that? What have you done? Has it, has it varied for you? Has it always been one or the other? How, how do you handle that? So I have to confess that um, I was never that popular back at my youngest ages. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I love that. I, I mean, so I have to say the idea that I could be like <laughs> has always kind of been a surprise to me. And you combine that with this kind of cognitive short circuit that I have as a professor when I'm in a meeting, and you've seen me in them, Perry, is when I'm in a meeting and somebody presents an answer that doesn't feel right to me, I become like a machine gun trying to dissect the problem and figure out why the answer isn't right and why it isn't striking me right. And I can become like a dog with a bone on figuring out the answer. And again, it's not about me having the answer, but I'll pick at everybody in the room and find out what kind of data we have and things. Yeah, because you're just trying get to get to the answer. Right? Yeah. And so... So I think because of that cognitive short circuit that I have, and because I never grew up as a popular kid, <laughs> that it never occurred to me that I could be liked. And I'm always kind of surprised sometimes when people like me. Oh, I, um, I whereas, find that hard to believe, but I, I believe you. But right, it's, no, you know. but whereas I was brought up by a dad who was a physicist, and his whole thing at the dinner table was challenging us to think. 
But he also had the Encyclopedia Britannica on a bookshelf within... He didn't even have to move out in of the his dining chair, room. In the <laughs> dining room. And his whole point is, he didn't reward us for when we were especially clever. Because that's clever, but if you thought about this, this, and this, what he rewarded us for is when we thought through what data we needed, what information we might want to figure out how to answer that problem. And the information was sitting right there in the Encyclopedia Correct, so Urbanica, and, and there were it. a whole bunch of other textbooks there, you know, different reference books. You know, we had the, thes- you know, the Bartlett's book of quotations was there. And there were some Feynman lectures on physics that dad wow. had had us, you know, because dad was a physicist at Bell Labs. And so um, I think that that's part of dialogue to me was about thinking through the problem with people. And so I think I've naturally ended up in the respected piece. Yep. And that's why I, sort of as I've gotten promoted, it's always been a surprise for me, especially in those early years, because I knew I wasn't especially popular as a personality. But I think what happened from that is because you could trust my, in- you could trust my intentions when you are in a room with me solving a problem, yep. you knew I am there to get the problem solved for the organization. Yep. And that that because I'm not veneering it about me, yep. Yep. it's like I think people just trusted my intentions. So they began pulling me out early on mm-hmm. to work on special projects because they knew I'd be a great team player, a yep. team contributor. Yep. Two of the things I think are really great about you are your um, integrity um, and your authenticity. You are who you are, right? And just there, you owned it, you know who you are, and you make it work for you. Um, And I think that in in these days, people are so hungry for authenticity. And so if you're playing straight, if you're just being you, and they all know you're going for an answer for the organization, then that is going to actually make you more desirable. Whether it's liked or not doesn't matter, but you are somebody that they want on their team. So... You know, tied to the fairness question also is the, is the amount of scrutiny. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, women are clearly more scrutinized uh, than men in, in everything, in their looks, in their parenting choices, in everything where that really isn't on the table for a male CEO, right? You don't see a lot of headlines about, you know, what kind of outfit he was wearing or whether he'd gained weight or whether or not he had decided to stay home or take paternity leave. But it is very true for women. So how have you handled this added scrutiny? And back to the physicality thing, we talked about that it does matter what you look like and, and how you um, hold yourself and how you behave. How, how have you handled that? Do you have a, like a go-to uniform? Do you have a way of approaching that whole scrutiny piece? Well, there are two things when I went from being a senior professor to a dean in sort of one jump. I got an executive coach and I got a personal shopper at Bloomingdale. And she got me some really great suits and um, and she helped me sort of how to get show, get a little flair. And for the first few years, you know, she dressed me. Mm-hmm. And I have to confess, in the later years, though, I, the nice thing is that I think things are loosening up. And so I'm beginning to feel like I can relax, you know, now with some of the casual wear and things. But of course, yeah. women casual wear and men casual wear are not the same. I also think, you know, in, in the scrutiny thing, for me... I always kind of joke, it's like I, I hit the sweet spot, which was that all the research says if you're too pretty, that's a distraction. And yet if you're so unattractive or inappropriately dressed, that's also a distraction. So I was kind of like right in the sweet spot, right? I'm tall, so they say that's good. You're tall too. So it's like tall and attractive enough to be okay and not so attractive to be distracting. And so my whole goal of my wardrobe approach or whatever was to say, I need to fit in. I need to be appropriate. I don't want it to actually take away from my substance. Um, and so, and in that way, I felt comfortable and able to perform. So we often hear it's lonely at the top. Um, I think even more so for, for women sometimes. Um, I know that, you know, you live in Evanston and um, it's a very small community. It gets small pretty fast at the top looking at women. Um, so how did you, how did you create a support system and how did you find female friends? Because everybody needs a safe place that they can go and people they can really let their hair down with, if you will. So the really neat thing is by coming back to Evanston to head Kellogg, and that's the place where I had my babies as a graduate student, is there were a whole bunch, there were three or four women who I adored that I had babies with, um, who were still in Evanston when I got back, who had nothing to do with Kellogg. Oh, they wonderful. weren't successful executives. Yep. And it turns out that they're very grounded people who mm-hmm. will hold me accountable all three of them. And so it was really neat to pick up those friendships again. And again, they had nothing to do with anything else I do. And in fact, I think one of the things I enjoy about them is they're people where we picked each other just based on who we were. Yes. And who we are. And we still share a whole lot of values. And so I still am most comfortable with the kinds of people that I picked out to be my friends in my, you know, in in my twenties and thirties. And I've, like you and I, we've become friends, but I've been very selective. There are a whole lot of people I interact with professionally that your really close friends are the people who you 
um, have a deep connection with on a human level. Um, and there's a big di difference between professional friendships and true personal friendships. Agreed. And the personal ones are the ones who get you through. Yes. Um, I agree. I think both are important, but I think the truth is that at the top, you've got to have personal friends. I, I, my two best friends both happen to be named Sue. One I've had since age four and one I've had since age of like 24, right? And it, as you said, there's just, there's no bullshit between us, to be frank. It's just, and they are in such, one of them is like a nuclear engineer, could not be more different than I am physically at all possible. Um, but we are very real with each other. We know exactly who each other is. We don't take any stuff. We, we try and help each other, support each other. And, and you know it's a safe place to go. We're almost at the end here. So looking back, how would you say, are you happy with how everything turned out? Would you, would you change anything if you could? You know, I, I mean, we are so lucky to be women at this point in time in this country doing the work we do. I am aware every day that I have it better than more than 99% of the women on earth. Mm-hmm. Because I get to have an intellectual job. I get to have a management job. I get to have children. I get to have friends that love me. I get to have financial independence. Yeah. Um, I've, I have the grace that I recently got a second home in this place I've always dreamed of owning a home by the ocean. And I'm kind of going, if somebody had told me in my 20s that this is where I'd be at 55, man, I would have worried a lot less. Yeah. And man, would I have said, you are one of the luckiest women in the world. And the reality is, compared to any metric this time period, and certainly anywhere back in time, we are lucky than millions of women that have lived. Agreed. Agreed. And I don't have it all mm -hmm. by the people who think that you have to check all these boxes, but I do have it all on any real measure of life, love, beauty, um, richness, and that's what matters. Agreed. It's so interesting that I, in the moment, sometimes I have to remind myself how lucky I am to be even struggling with whatever I'm struggling with. Um, but I think you're right. If you can, if you could go back and say, you know, just enjoy the ride and, and, and just know how blessed you are to even have the opportunity to be working this hard in the middle of the night for somebody who you really don't care whether they, you know, get 5% market, market, market share. Exactly. But it's a gift to even have that opportunity. So I think it's, uh, I think you're so right. Well, and I think one of the things that my daughters benefit from that I didn't is my mom didn't know how to coach me through those mom moments. When my mom heard me crying from stress at those early jobs, I think, you know, she was ready to say, go quit and do something you want to do, which would have been the wrong advice, right? Yep. Whereas when my kids get stressed, I go, I know it's hard, but you're going to be stronger because of it. Yeah. And man, I know that's hard. And why don't you take, you know, that Amex that, that, that you share from, with me for emergencies, go get a latte on it. Okay? <laughs> or something, you know? But the one thing that our kids and these next generations, if we do it right, is we're going to be able to talk them through it. We're going to be able to coach them through it. Yep. Because um, I think that if there's one thing I could change, I wish that, again, there had been more people along the way when I was stressed and I was worried and yep. I was a single mom going through divorce and I was trying to get tenure and I was the only woman, you know, there are fewer than 10 women at the University of Chicago and I was the only one with kids. I mean, I just, all those things, if there's one thing I wish I had was more companionship, you know, content-specific companionship along yep. the way. And the great thing I think we've got to do with the next generation is be that for them. Well, and that's part of what I'm trying to do with your career, your terms. Give people insight, inspiration, connect to real stories. Because I think that as young women hear the stories, um, because you, you can't possibly mentor every woman in America, um, and, and neither could I. And yet, I think if they can hear what really happens and how it goes on, I'm hoping it will inspire them and give them that strength to keep going when they feel like giving up. What would be your last word on this? If you were to try to kind of sum up what you would say to a young woman who wants to have the career and life of her dreams, what would it be? Well, I think it's hard to imagine having the career life of your dreams if your needs for meaning aren't met. And so I think that your personal life has to exemplify your values and I think your work has to exemplify your values. And so for me, that's always meant putting the quality of what I'm doing over the money. And I think it's really important to separate money from meaning. And so if there's anything I think that I learned early on is I understood that I was a meaning junkie. I couldn't earn, it was, it, I didn't care enough about money to put that ahead of meaning. 
and I was willing to hold back on material things. Now it's turned out I've done better than I ever imagined materially. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, but I think that that partly came because people saw me as so committed to everything I did. Yeah, exactly. Right. And I, and I was committed because I believed in it and it's created opportunities and friendships and things because of that and, and professional, um, alliances because I was always such a high performer and I was a high performer because I believed in what I was doing. So I think you got to put meaning first. Excellent. I think that's, that's great advice. And, and now if you look at, you know, the research again, millennials, that is what they're doing. A lot of them are saying, we will not take jobs where we don't believe in what we'd be doing. And I salute that. I think that's awesome. I think it's, I think it's great. They're not saying they won't work hard. Right. They're saying, I'm not going to work someplace I don't believe in. And like you, if I believe in it, then I will work hard. But if it's kind of a job I don't have a real emotional connection to, then the truth is, yeah, then I, I want to go home at five, right? Because I'm kind of done. Um, but the only danger with the millennials is I worked really hard in my 20s yep. to be able to learn. to. Now I'm effective. Yep. So the only thing is you don't get it all met. Like in your 20s, your job is to accumulate experience and training. You're not going to hit meaning nirvana then because yep. you don't fully know yourself. You don't fully know your skills. So that's the only thing I sometimes worry about with millennials. Right is you don't get it all at once. And so then your advice is, it is going to be meaning over money, but as you're going through it, you just still have to do the work. So if you don't have meaning in your first job, don't think that, you know, your, your example, BCG, right? It was the launch pad. It was, it was critical for you. And training. Correct. But it wasn't where your heart was. So that you've got to go through the periods where you're not doing the hard work in order to earn the right and have the skills and capabilities to even, do the hard work. And even know what meaning means. Like, I think you've got to get through your 20s to begin to know where you get your meaning from and to have the skills then to be able to make a difference in yep. those fields. Yep. Because we know, I mean, despite your internships and all those things during college, you don't really know about work until you're going and earning a paycheck. Amen. And you're waking up every <laughs> single day, and some days you're saying, the last place in the world I want to be is work, no matter how much you love it. Mm -hmm. And work, learning how to work through that, learning how to approach each day with dignity and grace, learning how to not be short-tempered under stress, I mean, all of those things take time. So that's the only thing I'd say is, you have to earn the right to begin to make choices, you know, know what meaning is. And so remember, your 20s are not about balance. They're about more training and education and insight into what work really is and what your skills are in the work world. Excellent place to land. Thank you so much, Dean Blount. Uh, it was really great to have you on the show. You've been listening to Pivot Points, a series designed to help ambitious women have the careers and lives of their dreams. To hear more interviews, go to www.yourcareeryourterms.com and be sure to tell us what you think. If there are topics you'd like covered or people you'd like interviewed, please let us know.